uh, and as a result, I have asked for uh, no cost extension on this, but I have done a few things with EM Toolkit. Um, let's see here. I've added uh, Mark Chung's um, uh, DEM uh, method to it. And can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. Um, and I've also added some IPy widget interaction controls so you can kind of uh, manually uh, flip through various things. Like there's a drop down here that uh, switches between the algorithms, actually. And what I need to do is reconnect to my SSH socket. Let's try that. There we go. So I have pre computed in memory uh, DEMs for this region for both um, Mark's algorithm and uh, my DEM algorithm. Um, you flip back and forth between them and compare them here. Um, this is still kind of a work in progress. Uh, let's see here, what else can we do? So there's a little crosshairs here, which uh, selects which point it shows on the top right. And you can move that around with these sliders. Um, it's kind of slow right now. It's redrawing the whole thing, but um, you can see it updated that. Um, and uh, this image in the center is based on these composite channels. You can move these passbands around. Um, like, uh, let's see here. What should I do? So I can make the the widths of them smaller, uh, which changes the contrast and also affects the sampling. Uh, this color reference here, you can see it, it now gets dimmer in between them because they're not really sampling things quite as, as uniformly. Um, we can also move them closer together. Uh, pretty much narrower sampling, that kind of thing. Um, let's see here. And uh, there is a repo uh, for this. Uh, it's now public, which is right here. I'll post the link in the chat. Um, it doesn't have, I haven't added the interaction stuff uh, yet, but that will be coming in the next few days. And that's about it. Cool. Any questions for Joe? If not, thanks, Joe, for the quick update. Um, yep. We can go ahead and go to the next presentation, which is, yeah, Stephen Bell with the Hermes Science Operations Center, um, kind of overview intro. Hey, everyone. Um, let me, can folks hear me? Yeah. All right, let me share my screen for the slides. Um, so Bill, Bill Patterson is the, um, oh, no, is the uh, project scientist for this mission. And he's gonna kind of cover some of the measurements in science at the front. Bill, are you there? I am here. I'm I'm getting feedback through probably an open mic somewhere. Um, so hopefully that's not a problem for everybody else. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, right. So uh, I'm the project scientist for Hermes, and and I think that you know the perhaps the main point of this presentation here is for Stephen to talk about the uh, science operations center that he's heading up. But in fact, um, Hermes is is the uh, first customer for that sock. Um, so, you know, a lot of the uh, architecture is being developed around Hermes. And so for, for context, I can give you a little overview of um, Hermes uh, for those who are unfamiliar. I see a few familiar names on the list of meeting attendees here, but not a huge number. Um, so, uh, yeah, can we back up one slide? Yeah, so sorry. I'm not sure why it flipped automatically to the next slide. Uh, yeah, um, 
could be could be my PowerPoint was set up for a show at some point <laughs> that's happened before. Um, hopefully it'll stick here for a minute. So Hermes is a heliophysics environmental and radiation measurement experiment suite. Fairly clever acronym. I did not devise that. Um, so so Gateway, of course, is is a human exploration endeavor. Um, and uh, but but they're they're quite serious about having science on board from the very start. So um, I, I sometimes call Hermes a mission of opportunity, but of course that means something else at NASA. We're not we're not a mission of opportunity, but this was an opportunity for a mission that Helio jumped on. Um, so there, there's a lot of details here. It's 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 not is very abnormal in terms of NASA projects in many ways, had to come together very quickly, um, it, which meant having to fly instrumentation that really had flown before. Um, and it also meant that we developed a lot of our science objectives actually after uh, the mission was, was uh, determined to go on board. So um, the, the, those are all unusual features, but, but beyond that, we, we um, you know, we have a set of science objectives and, um, and uh, and and uh, you know, I think mission operations and and uh, achieving the science will will pretty much be up to NASA norms. Um, so the picture here shows uh, uh, the first two gateway modules. They're going to be uh, launched together. They're being called the co-manifested vehicles. Um, and uh, presumably they're entering lunar orbit here. Uh, Hermes is going to be on the halo module, um, originally proposed to be on the power and propulsion element, but that wasn't very good for our science. Um, and then we got, actually, I'd tell you where we are on the halo, except you can't see it because it's on the far side of the spacecraft from this point of view, but um, it's not particularly important. Anyway, we're, we will be the first NASA payload on Gateway. Um, there will also be ESA, and JAXA payloads on board um, with sort of complementary measurements, but I'm not going to talk about those. So um, really, really just want to talk about the Hermes. And um, we're a set of particles and fields instrumentation um, plus, a, plus a set of magnetometers. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about that. And, and now we can go to the next slide. Now it doesn't want to change. All right, I changed the slide. So it's obviously updated on my side. I'm not sure. Oh, I'm I'm not seeing the update. Um, Neither are we actually. Hmm. I'm not sure what that means. Is it still not updated from your end? No, unfortunately not. Maybe. Uh... A good old turn the power off and back on will work. Stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I I could try and share it from my end. I've got the I've got the slides. Yeah, whichever works. What do you think, Stephen? Sorry, I disconnected my VPN. Hopefully that helps. And I reshare the screen. Okay. Uh, okay, we're getting there. We're back at the first slide, uh, not in presentation mode. Yeah. Uh, All right, can you see this? Yes. Yeah, slide please. Nothing is changing. No, oh, sorry. Did you want this one? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go back. Where, where were we? Maybe I was confused. Um, oh, yeah. No, this is correct. This is where we want to be. I just wanted to show, um, you know, uh, initially, um, Gateway is just going to be those two modules, and it will be that way for a couple of years, probably. Um, eventually, the full-up Gateway is going to look much more complex. Besides the, the two initial modules, there'll be, you know, landers and, and logistics modules and, and the Orion coming and going and, and a couple of other uh, more permanent modules. But um, so, so things will get more complicated. But um, we're going up with the first modules and things will be relatively simple. Now we should go to the next slide, please. And let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. 
Uh, let, me, let me just run through this. This is sort of a summary slide, but I think it's it's worth just going over these points up front. So th this is a this is a directed mission um, directed to Goddard. Um, three of the instruments are coming from Goddard uh, with uh, with uh, collaboration from University of Michigan, actually, and and then um, there there is an experiment uh, coming from UC Berkeley. Um, launch is not earlier than November 2024. Uh, so, so these modules will be driven out to lunar orbit um, using the power and propulsion element, which is an ion drive, which is low thrust. That means uh, uh, instead of a, a couple of days or a week to lunar orbit, it's going to take approximately a year. Um, that's, a, that's a long time in transit. Uh, we do not have science objectives for the transit, although we may do some we may do some opportunistic science on the way, but our instruments are really not um, designed for the radiation belt. So uh, it's, uh, there are reasons not to run things in that region. And, and really we don't have science objectives that have to be satisfied there. Um, once we get to lunar orbit, we expect a two year nominal science mission. Although as long as the instruments work, um, it will probably be extended um, uh, for some time because uh, in fact, to, to end, end our mission, they really need to remove us um, and they won't have an arm up there to do that uh, during the first couple of years. So we'll have to wait for an arm before they can take us off and put us onto a logistics module or someplace else. Uh, so the science objectives, the fundamental science addresses um, science of the interplanetary medium and uh, then also a science of the uh, terrestrial magnetotail. Um, these objectives um, will leverage Gateway's unique polar orbit. I'll show you that orbit in a moment. Um, and, and also uh, we will leverage uh, uh, observations from other NASA heliophysics missions. Um, our, the nature of our instrumentation uh, is, is not entirely unique and this is a good thing. Of course, we're, we're um, entirely in situ measurements and to understand the system, you need other spacecraft at other locations. Uh, in other parts of the system and, and um, Demis, uh, Artemis probes are, are going to be especially useful for this science and solar wind monitors are also going to be very useful for the science. Um, the, the other thing about this, and this actually is, is a, a major um, goal for us, is that um, this is being seen as a pathfinder mission. And, and in part, this is in conjunction with human exploration. Um, the belief is that, you know, to do accurate space weather predictions um, for uh, for, uh, for, for exploration crews um, on, you know, uh, spacecraft supporting, uh, you know, human exploration, um, you probably want to have some sort of space weather station on board to give you um, local measurements of the space weather environment. And then this, of course, will be fed into, into space weather models. Um, but, but having those uh, local measurements is probably very important to have accurate local predictions. So uh, we need to be able to make these measurements from something like the Gateway, a, a large complex um, spacecraft uh, uh, to support human exploration. And, and our instruments are, are, you know, it's well demonstrated that they work. Um, and, and they can make uh, good measurements from scientific spacecraft, but scientific spacecraft are designed to be platforms that um, are, are basically quiet and, and don't interfere with the measurements. And we expect Gateway is going to be a much more complex environment for making measurements. So that's a major objective for us is just to figure out how to make use of these measurements uh, taken from the Gateway platform. And then I uh, mentioned the, the science that we have the four instrument teams uh, who will be doing science. But in addition to that, headquarters selected six interdisciplinary science teams to contribute to the science. So we will be working closely with the, those teams. And of course they will be heavily dependent on the SOC um, for, for data. Uh, next slide. Uh, so these are, these are our three major goals. And then on the left is an illustration of the, uh, of the orbit of the moon around the earth. And, and um, just to remind you that we will spend about 80% of the time out in the solar wind. And then about 20% of the time in the uh, terrestrial magneto tail. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, like many things, um, Gateway sort of uh, 
uh, drives our, our science goals to some extent. So um, we have major goals. There are objectives that I'm not listing here, but um, the goals are to understand solar wind mass and energy transport, uh, characterize energy topology, ion composition in the deep magneto tail. And then uh, we keep as a major goal uh, this goal C, which is to establish observational capabilities um, as, a, as a pathfinder payload uh, to uh, measure local space weather to support um, human exploration. Um, go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to show you this. Um, this, this is important. Uh, we have a lot of impact on, on um, how we do our science. Uh, so this illustrates uh, Earth in the background on the left and then the, the, the lunar orbit. And then uh, at the moon, you see the, uh, two, uh, the orbits of the two Themis spacecraft. Of course, they're already there and have been for quite some time. Um, the, they, are, they are in uh, essentially equatorial orbits um, and, and separations range from about two to five Earth radii. And then uh, uh, Gateway is going to be in this, um, in this uh, polar orbit with uh, uh, Apolloon, um, Apoapsis uh, uh, in the south and Periapsis in the north, um, about 11 Earth radii. So this gives us a nice little multi-spacecraft constellation. And although the instrumentation on Hermes is not identical to the instrumentation on the two Themis spacecraft. Um, it is, it is uh, very similar uh, in many ways. We have an electron spectrometer, we have an ion spectrometer. Um, the, all the spectrometers cover similar energy ranges. Um, Hermes has the advantage that it's a mass spectrometer. Uh, Themis doesn't distinguish ions according to mass per charge, um, but uh, Hermes will add that capability. Uh, there are magnetometers, um, and then there, there are energetic particle detectors. They cover somewhat, uh, the Themis detectors and the Hermes detectors cover somewhat different ranges, but, um, uh, but, but, the, but the three common instruments, spectrometers and magnetometer, give us um, a lot of points for reference from the, from the three different spacecraft. Um, next slide. These are the instruments. Uh, Merit is a, is a, uh, a miniaturized electron proton telescope. Um, it's, it's an energetic particle detector. So, you know, it will be good for analyzing things like coronal mass ejections. It's um, in some ways, it's probably the, the data at least will be the simplest uh, data set um, to work with. Uh, it's a set of, uh, there, there are two telescopes, uh, one in looking more or less sunward and in incorporating the, the direction of the Parker spiral and the other looking anti-sunward. Um, so two directions and a, about a dozen energies or so, energy bins um, uh, up into the uh, MEV range. Uh, Nemesis is, is the magnetometer, um, it's a clever acronym, noise eliminating magnetometer, a small integrated system. Um, we're not going to be very far off the surface of the gateway. Uh, and we, we don't ha we have a, a boom that, that gets us about a, we're expecting to have a boom that will get us about a meter away from the, the gateway itself. Um, and, and that boom has to be retractable um, for reasons having to do with uh, more with human spaceflight than with science. Um, so we don't get a long boom. We will be fairly close to gateway. Any magnetic interference from gateway is gonna have to be eliminated to understand the geophysical magnetic fields. Um, so there's actually three magnetometers. There's a, there's a, a, a flux gate magnetometer, which is the main science magnetometer. And then there are two of these little PNI magnetometers uh, to also measure the magnetic field. They're in, in slightly different locations. Um, so uh, gradiometry, magnetic gradiometry basically will be used to try and separate the uh, geophysical signal from any noise generated by gateway itself. So there's a level of complexity to that analysis that you wouldn't necessarily see in a, on a science spacecraft. Um, span I is the ion spectrometer, uh, mass spectrometer that's provided by UC Berkeley. Um, it's basically a copy of the solar probe analyzer. Um, EEA is a, an electron electrostatic analyzer that's, um, that's coming from Goddard. Um, and, and these will measure phase space densities so that, you know, uh, uh, multiple directions, multiple energy bins, um, 
for for both of these spectrometers so that you know they each produce uh, you know several thousand measurements in an instrument cycle and then these can be reduced on the ground uh, to things like uh, to summarize the plasma uh, characteristics like the density and the temperature and, and the bulk velocity of, of the plasmas, um, although there's plenty of physics in the raw phase space densities themselves. So uh, level two data will be phase space densities. Uh, level two data for magnetometer will be um, individual measurements of magnetic field calibrated from the three uh, sensors. And then level three data for the magnetometer will be a data set with the, uh, with the um, interference fields removed. And uh, level three data from the spectrometers will be things like densities, temperatures, bulk flow velocities that are reduced from the um, phase space densities. And the next slide, almost done here. Uh, just an example of some of the science that can be uniquely achieved by, um, by Hermes working uh, together with uh, the Themis spacecraft. This is a, the, this 10 Earth radius distance of Hermes uh, from Themis is a very nice scale length to investigate structure associated with things like uh, flux ropes and CMEs, um, which is implicated in the uh, energization of, of particles uh, in the solar wind. So that's a, that's a problem that people are still investigating and we hope to be able to contribute uniquely to that science. Uh, next slide. And, um, and here's an example of something we can do in the magneto tail. Um, there are many models uh, to predict uh, ionospheric escape and what that does in the magneto tail. Um, these, these, uh, these models at lunar distances are really not tested uh, at present. Um, during the course of a geomagnetic storm, we expect uh, there may be quite a bit of oxygen escaping down the magneto tail, which is also a, a, an ionospheric loss process. Um, so having a mass spectrometer on board uh, will will be an advantage to understanding that and, and quite a bit of other science actually in both the solar wind and the magneto tail. And next slide. Yeah, and this is the last, I just a, a quick summary here. Um, so we hope to arrive in December, 2025, which is just after the, the predicted peak um, of, of this uh, current solar cycle. So that's excellent timing. Um, even if we end up getting, you know, even if there are delays, as long as we don't get there too long after the peak, we should have plenty of events, um, CMEs and so forth to examine in the solar wind. Uh, we have a set of well-formulated uh, space weather objectives. Um, instrument teams are going to be working with six interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary science teams. We're going to be heavily dependent on the SOC. And, um, and uh, just mentioned that these six IDS teams are going to help us um, with basic analysis of the measurements. Um, they're capable of doing that. OK, uh, take it over, Stephen. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, is, can somebody let me know if, I know we started early, but uh, I, I also don't want to make the next, um, you, next you've presentation got like, late. You've got like 20 minutes, so you're good. OK, thank you. All right. All right, so, so now that you have, I guess, uh, some introduction about uh, the measurement of science. Um, I was going to talk about the SOC and the software um, that we're currently building. So um, as you heard from Bill, you know, we are um, fairly early on. This is quite far in the future, right? Both with launch and then also with, um, uh, with transit and such. <clears throat> so, um, so uh, we don't have much capabilities there, but we're working on kind of frameworks. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute. So as Bill mentioned, um, this is technically the Space Weather Science Operations Center. Uh, it's kind of a new program under the Space Weather Line to develop kind of SOC operations for future space weather missions. And so Hermes is kind of the first mission. It's our first customer. So we really need to kind of build a SOC architecture um, and software architecture that is general and easily expandable to two missions. And I'll, I'll talk about um, what that means um, in terms of our how we're, how we're um, designing things. Um, and then also the, the other aspect, as Bill mentioned also, is that you know, these space weather products need to be made available as soon as possible for external users. Um, so we kind of, like, right now, we're kind of thinking of those products, we refer to them as quick look. Um, you can think of them as kind of semi-calibrated products. So, um, you know, those come out basically 24 hours. Um, and that means that we need to process those on, on our kind of SOC hardware. It needs to be, needs to happen kind of automatically um, and uh, put out to whoever 
is interested in using them to make predictions and such. And then of course, we'll have our normal science products, um, you know, fully calibrated, vetted science products. And those will come out later. Um, <clears throat> two really important things. I don't know if folks are um, paying attention to this, <clears throat> but I think it's very important for this community is um, these two documents um, that have, so uh, the new heliophysical division science data management plan actually was just updated very recently. Um, but then the SPD 41 scientific information policy for the science mission directive that came out quite a bit earlier. Um, so the heliophysics division science data management policy is in response to SPD 41. Um, I would, if you haven't read those, I would highly recommend you go out and, um, and have a look. They really set kind of a new standard for kind of transparency and open source, um, you know, putting everything out there. Um, and so we really want to be compliant and, and you know, do, do at least what they say and potentially go even further um, uh, with, with this, um, with our approach. So two of the kind of key things that are um, requirements are those, <clears throat> are those uh, documents is that um, all the funded software, so anything that Heliophysics funds has to be released under permissive permissive license uh, um, and shall be mail, made available in public accessible repositories. So we are doing that. Uh, and then um, kind of important for, um, you know, missions that are making measurements like a SOC or something, right? That we also need to make all of the, um, we need to make it possible for users to calibrate the data uh, themselves and to understand the calibration. So um, that means that all of our data processing code and calibration code needs to be made available. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you um, how we plan on doing that in just a minute. Um, so just some heritage, you know, we're, the, the background of the team is, is really kind of the MMS FPI team. Um, and then also kind of NICER and JEDI, um, if you're familiar with those those missions, the NICER and JEDI are astrophysics missions. Um, so our approach, <clears throat> just high level kind of philosophy, and I'll say this is mostly for, you know, the, a SOC has kind of two components. It has like kind of an operational component where you're operating and commanding instruments. <clears throat> um, that is, that is uh, not as appropriate to make transparent because we have ITAR issues with commanding and such. Um, so I'm really focusing on the science data center part of the SOC. That's the component of the SOC that's really, you know, processing data and um, using a pipeline and stuff and uh, creating kind of the science products that um, end up out in the public. So, you know, here, here's kind of our overall philosophy is that we really want to kind of maximize our reliance on free and open source software, uh, really reduce reliance on custom code. Um, the, the less code we need to develop ourselves and maintain the better. Um, we really want to be hardware agnostic and that means kind of cloud friendly. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what, what that means in a, in a minute. So we're con containerizing uh, things as much as possible. So using like Docker, um, you know, maximize automation, testing, documentation, building all the things, um, <clears throat> using modern approaches for software engineering, um, you know, clean code, linting, version control, all of that stuff. Um, and then develop software that is open source and consistent with community standards, uh, like the PyHE standards. Uh, maybe some of you may have noticed that I, I'm a signatory <laughs> to the PyHE standards way, way back. Um, so you can see my name there. Um, so I, I, I was on board with that um, even before I started working on the SOC. Um, and also develop software that's useful to the community as much as possible. And that means, you know, contributing to existing possible packages as much as possible and as, and as appropriate. So we really want to work with the community. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of the point why we're here. Um, so I just wanted, some of this is a little bit of a reference, but I just wanted to show, you know, our, our data. Um, uh, this is the data that we need to put out in our levels. Um, you know, you can see level one data is going to be put out 
publicly on a daily basis. Um, and then our level two and above, these are assigned data and that will come out kind of a standard, you know, monthly, um, monthly basis, kind of similar to uh, previous missions. Um, and then the, the quick look data product, that's what I was mentioning before. Um, <clears throat> these are kind of the daily se semi calibrated <coughs> data products uh, that will come out within 24 hours of receipt. Now, I have to say, excuse me. <coughs> My throat is a bit dry. Um, <clears> throat> uh, yeah, well, we still don't have a good idea of when we're going to get data downlinks from the gateway. Um, it could be, uh, it could be, it could take some time. Um, uh, so that's why the the releases will be right now. Our requirement is upon receipt on the ground. So we cannot vouch at this point since we do not control how often we will be actually communicating with the gateway. <clears throat> Um, so our architecture, so this really drives um, our, the software that we're developing. Um, so we're going to be using a hybrid cloud approach. Um, specifically, we'll be using M Amazon AWS uh, combined with on-site servers. Our data processing is going to occur exclusively on AWS. Uh, so that means that all of our code needs to run easily on AWS and um, uh, the the I mean, I'm at the PyHC meeting, so that's, this is maybe not a surprise, but all our processing code will be in Python. Uh, and then Docker containers will be used to manage the environment, both for the processing and also for the development. And I'll show how we're doing that. Um, and all our data products will be available on AWS since we're uploading everything for processing there. Um, and we will be providing uh, access to the Hermes team members to go onto AWS and 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 run, you know, data analysis um, and whatever else they would like there, we plan on having you know notebooks and stuff available up there. Um, right now, we this is going to be a little bit of a test. We do want to expand out to provide the service um, more generally, but um, we have to be a little bit careful about um, kind of costs. Essentially, um, we're going to open this up, I think, slowly. Um, so outside scientists right now is kind of upon request. <clears throat> um, of course, we don't have a data any yet anyway, so this will be in the future. And then the data will be served to the community by the SPDF. This is kind of the um, uh, the new approach. Again, that's that's being said. The primary data servers should be the data archives. Um, all right. So finally, we're getting to the uh, I think the good stuff uh, for this for this meeting. So, uh, and I'll, I'll take show a little tour about what we have right now. So we do have everything on GitHub. Um, <clears throat> you can just go, this is Hermes-SOC. Um, you can go there right now and see what we have. The, um, the current structure is that we have instrument packages for each of our individual um, uh, instruments. So you can see them all here, EEA, Merit, SpinEye, and Nemesis. Uh, and then we have a top level kind of parent package that they all depend on, uh, which is going to include functionality common to all. Um, uh, and so they'll, you know, they will, they will depend on this Hermes core. Right now, um, <clears throat> there's not too much, as you'll probably see if you look into it, you know, there's not too much functionality now because we're just getting started. Uh, I will say that these um, packages are, um, the template for the packages, I really have to, you know, thank the SunPy community. Um, this is a heavily modified version of the. Well, heavily kind of gives me too, too gives us too much credit. I, I I don't mean to to say that. It is a modified version of the SunPy affiliated package template, uh, which which I think is really great. Um, it sets up a lot of things um, so that um, you know we don't need to worry about it. We do anticipate kind of a first 1.0.0 release for all packages in about March of 2023. Um, that's when we should have kind of code uh, that can do some processing and such. Um, it won't be useful to the community because we won't have science yet. Uh, but you know, I would I would hope that people are interested. You can always comment and, and start discussions there or ask questions. Um, and now I was going to. Do like a quick tour. 
of, of the package that we have up here on our GitHub. All right, can folks see this? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. All right, so here's our GitHub. Um, you notice we have a few things pinned here. Um, you might be interested in, you know, reading more about um, <clears throat> about our, our Hermes. Uh, so we have our, actually our project data management plan. If you just want to go read, you know, um, our project data management plan. Uh, we intend to, like I said, you know, transparency. We intend to put out put out there, um, you know, whatever documentation that. Um, is helpful to the community and and is um, appropriate. Um, so so you can see we have these four um, instrument packages, and then uh, there is also the Hermes core package. Um, and let me just go through for which there's a outstanding pull request by Amy. Amy Rigger is our uh, SDC lead. Um, <clears throat> so let me quickly go through. So all of these right now are basically just the template with very little inside of them yet, right now. Um, but um, let's quickly go through. So we're using um, this dev container. So here is the Docker file that um, sets up our environment. You notice this is Ubuntu 20.04, and it's coming from Microsoft. And that's because we are um, uh, using Virtual Studio Code. Um, and Virtual Studio Code provides us uh, a really great way to set up a consistent development environment for everyone. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, I highly recommend you go and, and check that out. DevContainer.json essentially just sets up your dev environment. You'll notice it like sets up linting and all this other stuff. So you don't have to, again, consistency. Um, and then requirements is basically our current uh, Python requirements, which are really What's in here now is um, uh, is needs to be discussed a little bit more. But you notice, you know, we have NumPy, AstroPy, and SumPy, um, and then a bunch of linters. Sphinx. We're using Sphinx for documentation. Um, we're using GitHub workflows for all of our CI testing, um, uh, and you can kind of go through those. We do code style. We also build test the building of our docs, and then our standard testing as well. Um, on you know multiple versions of Python and such, um, <clears throat> we're using the the capability that the SumPy folks developed, which is the Town Crier um, capability that um, uh, that kind of gets managed through this change log. Um, I think I think we have to thank Stuart for that. Um, our docs, like I mentioned, are um, Sphinx. Um, we've also kind of built this. The doc template is set up to be consistent with requirements on from um, from headquarters. So it includes this uh, calibration um, calibration portion, dev guide, user guide, um, so on and so forth. And then we have our all our code and stuff in here, um, and kind of standard stuff here. Uh, and then we actually we are hosting our docs right now. They're being built on read the docs as is usual. Um, so you can kind of go see, here's a calibration and measurement algorithms document. So the idea is basically that we, that everything is contained in a single place. Um, you know, calibrate, we describe how we do our calibration and processing um, in here. We have user guide, developer guide. Um, all of this stuff, again, is mostly coming from some PI standards. Um, uh, so uh, again, we want to thank, thank that community for all of that. Um, uh, yeah, let's see what else. So if you if you actually kind of poke around in here, um, you'll notice there isn't too much yet because as I mentioned, the functionality is, is not really there, but we kind of have these kind of modules set up. So calibration, um, you know, we have a few kind of template functions in here that, that don't do anything yet because um, we're waiting for that. Um, that uh, input from the instrument teams, you know, tests, util, so on and so forth. And I think that's it for me, unless there are any questions. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, 
We had a couple in the chat. Rebecca was wondering two things. Um, will Hermes data be available through Happy? And could you please explain what you mean by L4 data, including model data? OK, so the first question is, uh, I think, yes, for sure. Because like I said, it's, it's all going to be served from SPDF. And my understanding is SPDF does support Happy. Um, so so yes, I think that's, that's, that's true. Um, the second one, level four data. Um, hey, can you repeat that question again? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problems. Uh, could you explain what you mean by level four data, including model data? The model data. So yeah, so this, so you're essentially talking about this particular one, right? So um, I did. For reference, um, I assume I, I'm going to upload these slides somewhere. Um, <clears throat> but I did put our current definitions for level data levels for each of the products. Uh, sorry, each of the instruments. Um, sometimes you we get up to level four. It uh, might be, still be TDD because some of this is still being uh, discussed and worked on. Uh, but you might notice, like, oh, where's yeah, nemesis. So, so three, um, that's the magnetic field at gateway that kind of brings together all of the magnetic fields uh, into a single measurement, right? Because we have three sensors. Um, and then the next one would be, uh, I would assume that you use those magnetic field measurements and a model to produce a, 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 a higher level product. Do we, yeah, Bill, do you have to get? Yeah, yeah, I could jump in and comment on this a little bit. So, you know, up up until now, um, each of the each of the um, science divisions uh, have have defined their own data levels, um, and and during this past year or so, as as policies are are being reworked. Um, Someone at SMD decided that the data level definitions should be uniform across the four different divisions. I'm not convinced myself how well that's going to work out. <laughs> but we were we were um, asked to uh, do our best to use those definitions. So there's a level one, two, three, and four. Um, four is is the one that uh, I think it's great somebody asked a question about it because in my mind, it's not very well defined. But anything uh, we want to put in out there that um, in, in the SDC that doesn't uh, fit into the uh, zero, one, two, or three categories probably goes into four. Um, it could be models of instrument responses. Uh, it could be models of the uh, magnetospheric or solar environment. I'm, I'm not sure yet, um, but it's it's there in case we need it. Great. Uh, did that pretty much answer your question, Rebecca? If you're talking, we cannot hear you. For the moment, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, Russell, I saw that your hand went up. Well, can you hear me now? Oh, yep, never mind. <laughs> we can hear you now. Hey, my computer. OK, um, one thing that's, now I'll say this straight. I'm coming from CCMC. That's my perspective. That's Community Coordinated Modeling Center. And one thing that we're talking with missions about concerning this is, particularly when referring to physics-based model outputs, is that um, we're trying to encourage, I'll phrase it this way, we're trying to encourage missions that when they think about this model output, that instead of it being output from a physics-based model, um, let the missions uh, put think of this quote-unquote model output as what they would put into this physics-based model. So like have their data in the format to put into the particular model that they want to run. But, but this is particularly referring to physics-based models, not like instrument responses and that kind of thing. So that I would say that definition of model output is definitely um, interpretable, <laughs> I guess is the right word. So, so Rebecca, just to be clear, you're suggesting level four should be um, kind of a normalized product that could be used by, for example, the CZMC to run a model as opposed to the output of a model. Is that, is that what you mean? Right, exactly. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And 
um, we can talk about that more offline. But there's a lot of reasons for it to be that way instead of specific model outputs, because the community wants to use that output for more than just one thing. Yes. Yeah. So, the input so have, to the model for more than one thing. Sorry. Right. Right. And and so I have been talking with uh, with Masha as well as uh, Yari uh, from the Moon to Mars. We are we are fully on board with um, creating uh, data products uh, that you guys can use and make as easy you know make it as easy for you guys as possible. Um, okay. Regardless of whether they're called level fours or not, I don't want to get into that philosophical yeah. discussion. I don't <laughs> care about names. I just want it to be useful for more than just one thing. Yeah, yeah. and I think level four, I think, actually can be um, contributed by by people outside the project. So, I mean, there's going to have to be discussions about how this all gets done. But but at least it it, it you know it it creates a category that sort of opens the door for that kind of thing. Yep, but. Yeah, well, y'all are already talking to Masha, so great. I'm glad y'all are already on, on the ball for it. Sounds yeah, great. and we're using the same cloud. We're using the SMCE. Um, so there is a possibility that actually we can just give her, give CCMC access to our buckets. And, um, you know, we're not even moving data. It, it would be super easy for, for you guys to run your models and stuff. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, Russell, do you have a quick question? Yeah, uh, well, one, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of custom software coming from the Science Operations Center here for the Hermes. Um, but within PyC, there's already some packages that, you know, kind of fulfill a number of, of these tasks. Are y'all still planning on doing a, a community evaluation of software to be incorporated into Hermes, or is it already kind of set that uh, you're going to be writing your own new code? So, so right now, so that's a very good question. Um, so right now, um, uh, as I mentioned, yes, we definitely want to use code that is already written <laughs> that we do not need to maintain. I did mention that at the beginning. Um, the code that I was talking right now, the data processing code, um, that is going to be highly specific to the instruments, right? So that will, you know, the, the nitty gritty of that code will have to be custom. Right. Um, I don't think anybody has written code to analyze, uh, sorry, to process Nemesis data right now <laughs> from from their level zero, level one. Um, but for example, you know, we're we're going to have to output to CDF files, of course. Um, and so right now we are going to go through a little um, trade study about which CDF reader slash writer we should be using, um, and. Um, I would appreciate sort of community feedback because my understanding right now is that there are at least three. There is one in PySat. There, uh, sorry, there's one in SpacePy. Uh, PySat has a, at least a reader. Um, I'm not sure if it's a writer as well. And then there is also CDF Lib. There may be others. <laughs> um, so yeah, we we do want to. Um, we're not planning on writing our own a new CDF uh, reader, right? Um, so we do want to use as much of uh, the stuff that's out there, and we're kind of starting that now, the, that process of evaluating what's out there. And so this meeting is actually very helpful for that. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Um, we need to move on to the next presentation, but I would advise you, Stephen, Bill, to look at the chat. There have been a couple other questions, I think, from Jack in there. But thank you for okay. this presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for the time. Yeah, of course. Next up, we have a presentation from Russell about PISAP missions. Right, let me just uh, click some buttons to share my screen. All right. Cool. All right, PISAP missions. Um, so this um, PISAP missions is one of the Packages in the PySat ecosystem, and we just had a uh, release yesterday, I think, or maybe it was even early this morning uh, on the test PyPy here for the latest code for PySat missions. So, um, and it was just actually integrated into Helio Cloud. So, I'm excited about that for the summer school. Um, so, what is PySat missions? Um, so, I've advertised before PySat as a place that is like where you can start science analysis from beginning to end. And I sometimes advertise that as starting with download. 
Um, but that's not where science missions start, right? You don't actually start with files as we were just hearing from the Hermes um, group, right? You actually have to get a satellite up there. You have all the software and instrument processing and things like that to do uh, before that's, that comes out. And typically before that, even you have to come up with the science idea, put it in a proposal, you know, demonstrate you can close science with the proposal and all that before um, the mission actually becomes a mission. Um, so that's where PISAT missions is coming in. It's, it's the right proposal and other development, and maybe even for CubeSat missions. Um, and then um, and later life, we're hoping for it to be, you know, accurate enough for active explorer level type missions. Okay, um, there we go. So here's the PySat ecosystem. So just a very quick reminder, PySat is the main plugin based generalized data workflow. So it's where you can get access to all the different types of instruments that we support across. Hey, the, Russell? Uh, yes. The slide didn't update. Okay, it wasn't just me. I was about to hmm. ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have a VPN. Um, let's see. What can I do? I have a green bar around my window. It says I'm sharing. It's not presentation mode, I don't think. It's not. Yeah. So let me try and then I'll switch to presentation mode. Sometimes presentation mode breaks things on its own. So. <laughs> Says participants can see my application. Can you see my PySight ecosystem slide? Yep, now I can. All right, I moved again. Can you see a new slide? Yep. Yeah, all right, cool. So PySight ecosystem, again, PySight is the main thing. It's the main user interface where all these different packages feed off from. And PySight missions is just one of them. So uh, here's a little demo I was just putting together this morning. So this is a static image, but it's coming from the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so PySat missions, what it has is orbit simulators and orbit propagators. So you can put in parameters for a satellite and um, then it's going to generate the orbit for you. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, so starting out, just going to import, oh, one click, uh, import PySat, import PySat missions. Uh, as I mentioned, PySat is a plugin based, you know, architecture. So PySat missions has the plugins that we want to use. So I'm going to register PySat missions with PySat. You only need to do this once per installation, but I'm showing it here for completeness. Um, talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, simulating and propagating orbits. So eventually I wanna look at the data orbit by orbit. So I'm here, I'm, I'm just defining that I'm going to be looking at LT kind of orbit. This is shorthand for local time. Then the index I want to break the orbit down over is gonna be magnetic local time, okay? Um, this, oh, I keep forgetting, don't click. <laughs> All right, so this uh, line here, I'm going to instantiate the PySat instrument object with this orbit propagator. So it's missions. So the platform we named it missions um, is from the specific software. It's called SGP4, which you know traces back to um, DOD type software. Um, so this is the actual propagator itself. Uh, here I'm popping in some orbit information. This is the thing I just defined up here. So this is a PySat keyword. And then the orbit simulator and propagator itself has a variety of options. You can define the inclination of your satellite. You can define the altitude periapsis. You can define the other part. You can define, uh, define it via two line elements. Um, there's a whole variety of keyword arguments that all map directly to SGP4. And here I'm just setting parameters for those. So I want a 10 degree inclination. And in this case, it's just going to be a circular orbit at 500 kilometers. Okay. So when if I did load here, it would run all of this and it would pull out all the SGP4 information, which be things like position in space and velocity and stuff like that. Um, but as a scientist, I'm going to want some additional things. And usually as an ionospheric scientist, um, looking at plasma stuff, plasma motion at the equator, I really like magnetic coordinates. So um, that's what I'm doing down here is I'm adding uh, a calculation of quasi-dipole coordinates. So this routine is part of PySat missions, methods, magcord, add quasi-dipole coordinates. It's, um, we didn't actually write the quasi-dipole coordinates here. What we're doing is we're coupling into apex pi, which does have quasi-dipole coordinates. So this method here is just a, a pretty simple wrapper that just is um, on, on the input side is compatible with PySat and then it invokes apex pi within that function. And then it just adds the data to the instrument object and pops it out. Uh, it needs to know what the longitudes, latitudes and altitudes are. So I'm just providing the string labels uh, that map to those variables. Okay. And then I'm attaching it to the custom object, uh, instrument object. 
So whenever I load, that custom function automatically gets applied. So here I'm going to load a day for 2019, January 2nd. I'm going to plot magnetic local time just to prove that this has been added. Um, so this is a pandas data frame here. So this is actually popping out a pandas series. So when I do a dot plot, it's just doing the default pandas plotting. Here we go. So I didn't add, add titles or labels. So sorry about that. But you can see magnetic local time is going 0 to 24 as it should. And we have a day of data. So that's the standard I ask for a day of data. That's what it pops. Okay. Uh, and then here's some of the information within the actual data frame. So I'm using just the Jupyter pretty printing. Uh, to make the pandas data frame here look pretty good. So of course, as the pandas, everything's labeled with date time. So everything's nice and organized. Got position and or, uh, ECI, velocity in the same, or centered earth fixed coordinates. This ECIs are centered inertial or centered earth fixed. Um, and then on the second page, or if I scrolled over, right, you still got more latitude, longitude, altitudes, all this good stuff. Uh, and the, these are the parameters that were added by the function above. This is a quasi-dipole latitude, quasi-dipole longitude, and magnetic local time. So these are magnetic coordinate package. Okay. And then if I want to look orbit by orbit, I can invoke PySAT's uh, generalized orbit iterator. So it will on the fly determine where there are orbit breaks based on what I told it before. What I wanted to look for was uh, orbits over local time and look at magnetic local time. So instrument is the PySAT instrument object, right? That's what we're looking at. Um, putting it in this for loop, the dot orbits engages the orbits iterator. And what it'll do each loop of this, it'll um, return uh, a copy of the instrument and put a single orbit of data in there. It doesn't copy the data, uh, you know, for performance reasons, but that's what's happening. So orbit ints is the same thing as ints, but a copy. And within data, now instead of a full day of data, has got just one orbit of data. And um, you know, if you if I let this for loop go, it would just keep, you know, orbit by orbit by orbit, and it just produced a ton of plots. So I put a break just to stop it at one, but we can see right, it goes to zero to 24 is appropriate. I'm plotting latitude here just for something to plot, and you can see the inclination I supplied 10 degrees is working. So that's nice. Um, and then if I go back to inst after that loop. Ints remembers where it was and its state. So that way, you know, it's convenient on the programmer or the developer side to work with it. So if I do an ints.data, you can see I have uh, just the first orbit. Now, you may remember from a few minutes ago, I said I loaded to begin with January 2nd of 2019, but you can see this first sample is from near the end of January 1st. And that's because I told PySet, give me the first orbit. And the orbit didn't actually start on that day. It started near the end of the previous day. So PySat actually loaded that previous day, checked it out to see if it needed it, determined that it did, and then made a complete orbit from the last bit of January 1st and then the first bit of January 2nd. Oh, there we go. So that's a nice bit of orbit uh, iteration. Okay. Um, so right now, general state is it couples uh, SGP4. That's the propagator I just showed. Um, it also has support for PyFM, which is another propagating program um, that was uh, open source. Um, our support for that is deprecated because where it just didn't have the because PyFM that package is no longer actively maintained. So we PyFM was one of the first things we supported, but you know time moves on. We've since added SGP4. It also couples uh, a few community packages. So AACGM, this is another magnetic coordinates package, Apex Pi, magnetic coordinates and some basis vectors. Uh, and I've also coupled OMMBV in there too. So that's a magnetic basis vector system. Um, so improved. So um, additions itself isn't so much doing so much. It's just coupling all these different community packages into PySAT uh, to form you know, some nice little uh, um, proposal um, support um, package. Okay. Um, based on SGP4 itself, we observe about a 10 kilometer accuracy on the satellite altitudes. Um, that's coming from the actual SGP package itself. So um, we are looking for some additional outside modules with support for orbit propagation. We're hoping to get something that's more accurate than that. Um, and there is a package that is in development called SatMag. Um, we have an issue in our on our side to evaluate this package as it, as it keeps going on development. But uh, here's a link if you want to check it out. And it intends to be precise enough for active satellite missions. So as backup, it's going to fall back SGP4 orbit type propagator. But then they are also actively developing one that's going to be um, based on it was going to use SciPy integration routines and then it's actually, you know, specify forces on the satellite and all that. Um, and, and their intent there is to get something that's actually you know, 
accurate enough for, for full satellite missions. And so that's the plan. All right, so thank you very much for the time. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Thanks, Russell. <clears throat> Looks like we have a question in the chat from Rebecca. Have you considered right. adding an interface to the geodyne orbit propagator? Geodyne? Yeah, G-E-O-D-Y-N. I hadn't heard of it, but we can take a look at it. <laughs> well, there you go. I finally remembered the name from yesterday, Russell, so you might oh. want to contact Katie. Um, Katie Gar Garcia Sage, um, she would know the right person at Colorado Boulder to contact for that one. I don't know if it's open source, but then again, if it's written in Fortran, so oh, nice. there's already someone working to pull it into Python. So it, it sounds like it's something that's timely to pursue. Okay, cool. Perfect. Thank you. And, and while yeah. you're here, you had the question yesterday about, um, maybe it wasn't quite yesterday, about only loading certain variables into models, you know, because if things got too big, I just want Great. to point out this keyword function that I'm using here, you can define keywords in any instrument support module and PySat will know about them. So a user can come along and just define it at instantiation. So you could always have, if you were going to add, add a you know model level, you could have some keywords like exclude variables or something and users could put a, a list in there and then it would get passed appropriately so that the supporting software could do, you know, what's asked, so. Okay, sure. Cool. Looks like we also have a question from Pete. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, that looks like a very nice package. I, I wonder by satellites, do you also mean spacecraft in general? So does this package support um, Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter, anything for which there's um, spice kernels? Um, well, in principle, yes. Um, right now, PySat supports things that the development team actually uses for science, and it had, has not included any of those. But um, it absolutely could. So there's nothing. PySat has got really broad general support. We've, we have like 80 data sets supported right now. So we've already seen a lot of different files and a lot of different data issues that we've been able to sort out. So I'd say most likely those instruments could be supported without any modifications on PySat itself. You just need to write the plugin stuff. And there's documentation um, on PySat uh, on how to add a new instrument. We spend a lot of documentation on that because that's one thing we really want is for the community to be able to add their own data sets to PySat. Because there, there's only four on the PySat team. There's just not enough people <laughs> to add all those data sets. So. Um, but if okay. that's something that you'd be interested in trying, we would certainly be available to help out. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Any more questions for Russell? Thanks, everyone. Cool. Well, thanks, Russell. Next up, we have Ryan McGranigan talking about an overview of the space collection. Great. Thanks, Julie. I will share my screen. How does that look? Looks great. Great, thanks so much. So I'm going to get into uh, the space collection via a project that we've been working on through the NASA Early Career Investigator Program called the Heliophysics Knowledge Network. I know a lot of you on the call here have been connected to this in, in very myriad ways. Um, but first, I want to thank you, Julie, and thank everyone who has been coordinating this, this community and this workshop. Um, it's really an honor to be a part of and, and uh, have the opportunity to present and share some of these ideas. So I put a link, uh, a QR code and the link to these slides if you want to get them and I'll send them to you afterwards, Julie. Um, but thank you again for the opportunity. So what I want to do is, is help you help make you aware of the role of networks or relational structures uh, and ha what role they're playing in heliophysics. Um, I'm going to take a tour through some of the activities that are going on to embrace the network structure in modernizing the way that we do heliophysics science in this information age, and then offer some suggestions about how this connects to this community um, and where Python can help build out some of this infrastructure. Um, I'll speak specifically about this Helio No project, uh, which I'm leading, but it's really an open effort consisting of many individuals, pockets of progress, groups, and efforts. Uh, and so I think you'll see a lot of you on this call uh, where this connects to some of the things that you're doing. Um, it inherently consists of open contributions and is envisioning an open science future for heliophysics. And I'll invite each of you to contribute to it, which is kind of where the space collection comes in. Um, so this talk will be part of kind of an ongoing series of virtual gatherings and development activities that we're doing through HelioNo. 
Um, and so that's a way of cultivating a community of practice around some of these tools that I'll talk about. But I want to talk and start with a very simple and what will become apparent is a very powerful idea. And the idea is that science and society are, are built on networks. Um, you probably recognize this to varying degrees in your own experience, but a network or a graph in the most simple way is a collection of connected entities and the ways that those entities are connected or the relationships between them. And it may not seem that profound, um, but once you see this, I think it's hard to unsee it across society. Um, so when you start to look across society, you recognize that these graphs or these networks are everywhere. Um, and so once you start to think in these terms, it's really hard to, to stop seeing them. Um, but it's, it's present at all levels of our society, from molecules that make up organisms to the infrastructure we've created, like the power grid, to the way that we relate to one another, so our social networks. Um, but this is, despite the ubiquity of the network structure being kind of a natural way that information exists in our world, we don't often represent it that way. And kind of a, the way that I think about it is if Google were something that we try to represent in a spreadsheet, the way that we often represent our data, um, it just it just would cease to be Google as we know it. It wouldn't be kind of this, this vast amount of, of knowledge discovery that, that we've come to rely on it for. Uh, but fortunately, long ago, the internet and those building it recognized the importance and power of the network representation. And so what I'm showing here is just a, an image of uh, what they call the linked open data cloud. Um, so this is kind of the internet as we know it, this profoundly sophisticated network structure. And these are all the data sets and resources on the internet that have been made into this linked data format uh, that, I'll, that I'll kind of introduce. Um, but it's the way that we network the collection of interrelated data sets on the web. So linked data lies at the heart of what semantic web is all about, large scale integration of and reasoning of data, reasoning on data on the web. Um, and so with it, we get the knowledge resource that is the web that we know it. Uh, and so this is, is really kind of a, a guide for us, but this is the, the knowledge structure that we know, the internet that we know. Um, but the term used to describe linked data format on the internet and many other examples of information is known as a knowledge graph. Uh, and so simply put, a knowledge graph is a different way to represent information, defining the entities or nodes, and importantly, the relationships between them, the edges between them. Um, so the problem is that the knowledge, know-how, and technologies to harness the power of knowledge graphs and linked data have largely existed only in industry, like Google, Amazon, and manufacturing. Uh, but the result has been that our, our sciences in the study of the physical world is kind of stuck in these less capable forms of data and community connection um, to the detriment of our discovery and to the disconnection of our community. Um, and so what happens is if we look at the heliophysics field, for example, we get the result of many disparate, disconnected pockets of progress, projects, groups, and resources. And to a varying degree that these, these are interconnected um, through some excellent efforts across our community, of course. Um, but the way that we're doing this is inadequate and incomplete. And so these pockets of progress largely stay within their own pockets. And you know you can recognize some of the problems that are talked about in this community where we reinvent solutions to problems that exist out there. Uh, we're not taking full advantage of the resources that exist. And we're not fully recognizing the, the contribution that's being made by some of these pockets. Um, and so these, this is kind of this, the disconnection that exists in our field. Um, but the problem is now that the problems were trying, the challenges we're trying to solve, uh, the degree of interconnection between data compute and between individuals are too great for us to continue on with this disconnected format. Um, and so a few of the problems that, that I kind of recognize, and I'll just call out that we're responding to with the heliophysics, the helio node project, is information overload. So everyone recognizes this. This is the amount of available data are overwhelming. Um, the selecting a data set can be challenge, a challenge, even if you're not a subject matter expert in that area. We don't use the data we're unaware of. Uh, the same is true for the resources to process, analyze, and understand those data. Um, I think this is kind of at the heart of what PYA she is. Data and tool dispersion, this is another challenge. Uh, so the tools and the data that we create are dispersed across a number of archives, web portals, and catalogs. It makes it very difficult to know where to start from or start from or where to go to next. And then finally, different languages. Uh, so different domains and subdomains have different vocabularies. And I think everyone recognizes that anytime we get together in a, in a meeting or a workshop or a conference, uh, the vast majority of that time is actually spent trying to understand what the other person's saying. Um, so this is a, a big barrier to transdisciplinary research. Uh, but the language barrier also prevents a researcher from one domain from incorporating information from a related domain in their work, which makes system science, which is inherently what I feel like heliophysics is, uh, impossible. Uh, and so the solution to that is, is something that we've been working on. We can get this 
interrelated network structure can be can help us address some of these challenges. And so that's kind of the premise of this Heliophysics Knowledge Network project. And I'm providing a link to the GitHub page here. Uh, we're trying to embrace uh, open science practices where the all the development is happening in that GitHub page across the wiki links there, the activities, the issues that you can open. Um, I know this community is very familiar with, with working um, through GitHub as a collaborative platform. Uh, but what Helio No is, is trying to do is build the know-how tools and the community to create a heliophysics knowledge graph. Um, Helio No is, is kind of described as the collection of software and systems for this improved information representation within our field. But also, and, and very importantly, it's, it's the commons as we've been describing it and more on this in a moment, but that's for the community to use and collaborate through them and, and help pick the, up the foundation and, and take it to where they need to go. Um, but it's trying to be the technological framework for more informed, participatory, and collaborative community. Uh, so the vision of what we're trying to do with this is quite expansive. Uh, and, and of course, it does link to a lot of the efforts that, that people in this group are, are working on. But here's kind of the expansive vision, some of the categories of things that we're doing. So the first is to understand what are the knowledge systems in heliophysics at the moment? Uh, how do we benefit from those and also not try and reinvent those, but, but uh, link back to those? So we need to review those knowledge systems. And we've been producing a lot of um, publications and things that, that describe some of those. Uh, then there's the glossary vocabulary development. Uh, so this is a matter of trying to take all the different vocabularies that exist across our field and, and how do we harmonize those? It's not trying to choose an authoritative vocabulary, which I think everyone recognizes that's tried to do this it is an impossible task um, and an unproductive one, but trying to harmonize those and really understand what glossary harmonization is. Uh, then there's the ontology development part of this. This is the actual backbone, the structure of a knowledge graph, a knowledge graph um, but this is, requires concept mapping the tools that we have in our field along with the phenomena and build the usable tools to, to, to harness that ontology. And then once you have an ontology, you can, you can actually build a knowledge graph on top of that, which requires interactive tools and platform that a scientist who's not familiar with some of these semantic technologies can actually use. And across this whole process to develop curricular materials so that we actually have create capacity and literacies within our field for doing these things. Um, it's really not a matter of trying to be an authoritative source or anything. It's a matter of creating capacity within the community. And then all of this serves science. Uh, so we want to demonstrate frontier discovery with linked data, uh, whether that's through natural language processing from the literature that we have, uh, machine learning or, you know, coupling phenomena. Um, so we're doing this in a number of ways, but we're really focused on the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling use case is a powerful place to kind of develop some of these things and, and make progress towards this vision. Um, so we're focused on this MI system at the moment, uh, and the reason for that is, is, again, it's an ideal use case for developing a knowledge graph for our field because it's inherently transdisciplinary. It requires a systems approach. It requires integrating a, a number of disparate data sets and tools, and many of the tools that we have available study different aspects of the system but are interrelated, and so we need to bring those together. Um, and the way that we're doing this is in a community way, so we're actually hosting collaborative virtual gatherings to kind of develop these conceptual maps, improve them, and then put them into prototype knowledge graph kind of structures that people can explore them and help us feedback and iterate on them. Um, but one of the common questions I get in building a knowledge graph or talking about knowledge graphs is how do you actually do it? Um, so I think most people understand the need and the importance of it, but don't know how to go about it. And so I want to provide a, a quick glimpse of what that actually looks like. Um, so building a knowledge graph is, is um, the purpose of this is not to replace existing systems. It really inherently interacts with them. Um, but the building a knowledge graph kind of outlines in these very high level steps that I've put in here. So the first is define a use case. Um, and one of the things that helps you do that is to define what questions your knowledge graph should be able to answer. So if you think about this from the Google perspective, what questions do you want to be able to put into Google and get an answer back that can give you, allow you to discover new information and better answer your question. Um, these are typically called con competency questions. Um, and so those are kind of the first things is defining your use case for your knowledge graph. It shouldn't, it, it should describe a domain of knowledge, not try and be the entirety of knowledge, if that makes sense. And these competency questions capture that. Then you want to identify common patterns in the use case, emerge the entities and relationships that your knowledge graph needs to represent. Then you establish a conceptual model for those entities and relationships and formalize those into an ontology, which, which requires some, some expertise in working with uh, knowledge engineers to, to actually do. Um, and then collect the data and the metadata that fills those entities and relationships. So kind of providing the structure for the things that exist already so that we can link to them in this knowledge graph. And then of course, like everything, it's an iterative process. 
that gets refined as we, we recognize the need. Um, uh, just a few words on some of the key concepts here. I mentioned competency questions, but these are questions that you want your user to be able to ask of your system that would get an answer and, and help them. Um, this is a way of scoping an ontology. And ontology itself is a system of concepts. It's the, the schema that describes the concepts and their relationships in this graph or network form. And then the conceptual model is kind of the precursor to that where you're kind of almost maybe drawing out on paper uh, what these entities and relationships look like. And this is where we're beginning with a lot of the heliophysics work um, because it serves two purposes of, of describing the foundation of an ontology and becomes an object for us to interact over during these virtual gatherings so people can understand this and start to, to work together. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, a number of people in this community were part of a, a workshop that we held for doing this process for the MI, for MI coupling tools themselves. So it was really focused on developing a conceptual model and an ontology for MI coupling tools. And this is where I'd like to introduce to this group. Um, I know this is kind of an eye chart, but I provided a link to the Miro board here if you want to access this and, and to dive into more detail. But this is, this is one of the things, one of the structures we came up with for making our tools for the MI coupling research more discoverable. Uh, and so I, this obviously has uh, implications for this Python user community who's developing these tools. Uh, you can see some of the, the, the models that we've been putting together for this. And I'd love to, to get your feedback from this. Um, but the purpose of this is to introduce you to it so that you can start to look and provide some feedback because the participation across the community is really integrate, integral to this network approach. Um, so I described how we might build a knowledge graph, but knowledge graphs are inherently focused on one domain of knowledge. We need to link knowledge graphs together, which becomes a knowledge network, and then also allow the community to participate in the maintenance and the evolution of those knowledge networks, uh, which is this kind of knowledge communities or commons approach. Um, and so this kind of gets to where we need to talk about some how we're actually working on this now as a community. Um, so this is this knowledge commons concept and it led to this creation of a kind of an open access publishing platform uh, using the MIT PubPub platform and it's called the space collection and we're trying to write pieces there that can be anything from very short form um, blog post kind of things to longer form development of some of these ideas but starting the conversation and getting people to kind of think longer form about some of these concepts and some of these challenges so that we can uh, develop the ideas and get people communicating around them um, for this. So I encourage you to, to take a look at the, the kind of inaugural piece that describes this whole concept here, and then take a look at the space collection itself uh, to contribute your thoughts to this. Um, but uh, the, the kind of underlying ethos of this whole project is, is open science. And I wanted to say just a, mo a, a word or two about open science um, because it's very topical right now. There's a lot of efforts going on in this domain um, but there's many definitions of what open science is, uh, but the one I like the best is, is that open science is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. And I think it really kind of captures what I've been trying to, to talk about here. The relationship to this project is that knowledge networks can democratize access to information, and it seeks to create the collaborative community to share the knowledge and the know-how from this. Um, so I think that the sensibility of open science is really important to this. But um, I, I, think it, I think to kind of harp on that, it's, it's important to recognize that there are a lot of efforts going on in this space, people who are creating these visions and, and responding to them. And I wanna highlight and point to just a few of those. And uh, just with the, the idea that um, we shouldn't try to be authoritative or final or the loudest, uh, we wanna really bring all of these voices and we need all of these people and all these ideas being brought together um, and so I've, I've listed a few what are, I'm sure, an incomplete and an inadequate set of um, projects going on or efforts going on in this space, but I wanted to make you aware of them because I think they're excellent opportunities for you to contribute. Um, so I kind of put this on the spectrum from projects that are working on a vision for this so that we know where we're going, project or aspects of this that are programmatic or supporting um, these efforts, and then implementation. So projects that are actually creating some of these tools and these prototypes. Um, there's a lot of really useful and powerful and, and wonderful work that's going on just shown on this slide here. Um, so I'll, I'll share these slides with you, of course, but uh, I think this could be valuable to you if you're trying to look for how you can contribute to this. Um, but what I would like to do today is, is maybe just pause there uh, so that we can have a few minutes at least for open conversation. Um, and, and I'll leave up this slide about some, some specific ideas for how you might contribute to this. 
uh, and, and I'll just, I would love to take some questions either now or offline. Um, unfortunately, I'll have to hop off around 1230, but uh, I'd love to, to talk with anyone at any time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions for Ryan? No question, but just a comment in agreement. I also like that definition of open science you used there. And it's the same one that I used in the paper that I'll be talking about here in a minute. <laughs> Great. Uh, go ahead, Rebecca. Okay, sure. I just don't like um, being the one that always talks. <laughs> But okay, so there's been a lot of focus uh, here and in other places about what's been going on stateside, particularly from NASA and NSF about open science and pushing towards pushing towards that goal. Um, but there's some efforts going on in other countries, right, internationally that I'm hoping to get connected with better. Do you have any knowledge of what those are and what groups are doing that? Yeah, that's a great question, Rebecca, thanks. I think the first one to mention would be IHDEA. Um, and so that's the International Heliophysics Data Environment Alliance, I believe. I think you're familiar with that one, so that may not be helpful to you. But another one that I think is really important is um, RDA, the Research Data Alliance. And so that's not, in, that's not disciplinary focused, uh, but it is an international uh, alliance and coalition of people doing kind of this infrastructure development and thinking. Um, so there's working groups, the way that RDA is structured is through uh, working groups and um, I can't remember the other the other structure, but there's there's two different ways to kind of get involved in that. And so they're kind of active communities that are developing these ideas. And I think that's really important because we don't want to develop these in isolation within, within, in isolation within heliophysics either. We want to make sure we're understanding what the other domains are doing so we can develop best practices as we're building these things. But I guess I would push you towards RDA first um, as, as a place to start learning. Thanks. And would love to hear from other people as well on that. I'm just curious. I remember the MI Coupling Tools workshop we did months ago now. <laughs> it doesn't seem like yeah. that long ago. Um, What's what's like come of that? Have has the knowledge graph been finished being you know fleshed out and finished, or is that posted somewhere? Is that on the Space Data Knowledge Commons website? Yeah, I can. I, I'll send the link to you in a moment. I do have a. Let's see some of the outcomes from that event. So, first of all, the thing there was um some useful recordings and then also some a write up from this that you can you can check out. Um, I think the collective notes are a good place to, to get all those links. And uh, let me, I'll just grab these and post them in the chat in a moment. But um, so we did, we did create these full competency questions. Um, the concept map that I showed you is something that's an artifact from that workshop. And then we actually developed that into a prototype coupling tools knowledge graph. And uh, that was done in, in a tool called Kumu, but I think we can now um, add some more semantic technology, I guess, expertise to that. Um, that's what we're trying to build out now. I guess the next thing that would be helpful from this group is I have a kind of a growing database of these MI, of MI coupling tool related or MI coupling related tools. Um, but I want to make sure that we're connected to all the Python tools being developed in this space so that we can add the metadata to those so that can be discoverable through um, through this platform. And then there's another we actually have a prototype kind of website that allows you to search like you would Google for these different tools. Um, and it's called the Helio Note Index. And I can grab a, a link to that as well and share it with you. So that has been grown into this thing that's actual, actually a prototype now. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to see that link. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll put a few in the chat in a moment. Great. Thanks. Any other questions for Ryan before we move on? Thanks again, Ryan. I've got one more, actually. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Yeah. Um... Don't know if this is going to be barking up the wrong tree or not, but going back to when you're talking about ontologies and stuff. Um, so I'm about to be um, submitting the paper I'll be talking about here in a minute to Frontiers in Astronomy and Space Sciences. And um, part of that submission process is you can upload a metadata file um, using like different, you know, 
tech keywords for your paper and stuff, and they recommend the schema.org vocabulary. I don't know if you're very familiar with that one, but I wonder if you've worked on any ontologies that are similar to or even better than what's on schema.org. Yeah, it's a good question. I would say that there's, from the science side, more people trying to make their science more discoverable via that ontology. So there's there's a project in the Earth Science Informatics Partners community called science on schema.org and uh they're trying to make scientific artifacts more discoverable using the schema.org because so much of the internet does use that on that ontology and that labeling um so it's a good way to kind of provide a translator between that to whatever whatever way you're representing your data in your field um and i'll grab another link to that for you but i think that's a great question and something that's very much an active area of discussion makes sense to me um, so that my hearing then at least that's definitely kind of the community standard here. The I'd say so. Org, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, Sean, you can go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready. Sure. Overview of your executable paper. I guess I can, can't I? <laughs> Let's see. I will share my screen here. All right, hopefully we're looking at an AGU poster, actually. Yep. Good, good. Yeah, so this is just sort of a follow-up from um, something else I presented on, I think, at the, the last fall meeting that we had. Um, it's the basically the first PyHC white paper is what I've been working on with the people you can see here listed up top. A few of you are on the call right now. I've seen Rebecca and Eric and Nick. So say hi to them and also give them credit for the work I'm talking about here today. Um, I presented this poster at AGU and to you guys back then. And this was kind of at an intermediate step of the project where it was starting to come together. Um, but this was sort of a progress update. And now I have like the actual paper and it's pretty much all the way written and pretty much just about ready to submit but it's changed and like uh actually the whole thesis was, was reworked so that we're coming at it from a totally different open science angle now and i was just going to um basically show what the status of the paper is at i'll i'll be doing my best to uh not just read you the paper and just you know skim over with the important bits but because it is an executable paper there there's cool code we get to check out in it so there's kind of the elevator pitch but i'll i'll click through like a couple of these boxes here just to set the scene for what we're talking about um the the focus of this project is on making executable papers which i think are really strong tools for supplementing um, publications, especially you know when we're talking about open science and trying to make reproducibility as good as we possibly can. You know, it, especially for Python research, uh, an executable paper is basically just a Jupyter notebook, but you put your paper's text inside the Jupyter notebook, so that you have ev everything all in one place. The the research and you know your words about the research and people can just click the little run buttons and totally reproduce your work without having to track down data or do any kind of leg with leg lifting actually um and we we do have a special science focus in this paper on um like magnetosphere things basically but um the, the whole science application sort of secondary to the whole point of just how open science can be improved by writing executable papers and by doing work in this collaborative way that we did. But just so that you've seen it once, we're talking about um, sort of two things. We're talking about finding the magnetopause for a, a big half of the paper, which is, you know, fun. It's that right there for people who aren't that in blue for people who don't know what the magnetopause is just the outer edge of the magnetosphere and um we we've got models that estimate where the magnetopause is and then we're using mms data in this research here and the idea is just to 
detect where the magnetopause is in the real data and then compare it to the model data and you can kind of test how accurate your model is doing that kind of thing. And we're also using um, the spacecraft fly-through software that's uh, part of the Komodo package to um, use models of like more of the magnetosphere. We're using the open GGCM model for anyone who's heard of that before. We can like, you know, model what the electronic, sorry, the magnetic field components are, and then get that again from the spacecraft and compare. And we think we got a pretty slick way to, to do that here, and we're, we're showing it off. Um, not not going to read through this here, but just a, a, an important point of how we did this work was this was very cross-disciplinary. This was, um, you know, I'm certainly not a scientist in the field, and I, I had to learn a lot of the science of, you know, magnetopause boundaries and such from scratch when I was working with this group. But as you can see, the lovely people flashing by in the upper right here, uh, we have a, a breadth of knowledge on the team. And actually kind of everyone just pitched in little bits, like people from, people like Rebecca from the CCMC really helped out with the, the modeling portions of this. Um, Eric was really helpful in getting the spacecraft data from Pi Speed S. And it was just a, a lovely, case of people working together to, to get a big problem solved in as little steps as possible. So let's see, let's just take a walk through this executable paper real quick, and then that'll be pretty much wrapping up the meeting. Um, the title right now is Making an Executable Paper with the Python and Heliophysics Community to Foster Open Science and Improve Reproducibility. Kind of a mouthful, but it's on the nose in a good way, I think. Um, let's see, I, oh, I'll leave the abstract up here for a second in case people want to glance over it, but the, the cool thing here is that, you know, we've been talking about executable papers a lot, but here is one right here. <laughs> we have the executable paper and I get to show it off to you guys. And, um, as you can see, just from the beginning, you know, it's a normal Paper, can you zoom in a little, Sean? You would expect. Uh, I can zoom in one more, and then it's totally filled up on my display. <laughs> Is that better? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? Yeah. Cool. I have kind of a big monitor in front of me, so maybe the text looks bigger than it comes across on Zoom. But, no, I yeah. think this is good. Yeah. Introduction, methods, results, discussion, all here. And in the methods section is, is the juicy part because that's where we actually have code that you get to run in line with the paper. So, you know, again, just to say that um, there is like, if you search PyHC on Google Scholar right now, you'll come up with an abstract from when we were first announcing the group's formation back in, I think, 2018. And we don't have anything else. So this is going to be the first, you know, real PyHC paper, and I think it's a strong one to put out here. We, uh, we have a whole section on open science and reproducibility, basically talking about the reproducibility crisis and how open science principles are taking aim at doing something about it. A section on the Python and heliophysics, because when you're introducing this work, you, you got to know who we are, I think. A bunch of stuff about what executable papers are, which will be apparent after you've seen this. And um, Deep Note is the platform that I'm do I'm doing this on right now. Uh, oops, kind of glitched out there. Um, for people who haven't seen Deep Note before, it's a lot like Google Colab or just any other hosted Jupyter Notebook service that you've seen. But this one's really cool because it has real time um, collaborative editing kind of think Google Docs where multiple people type on one document and you can see everything pop up in real time. It's ironic that Google Scholar does not have that feature anymore. They actually disabled it back in like 2017. Google's the person who you know spearheaded that whole collaborative editing uh, feature, but for some reason, it's not a part of Colab anymore. So DeepNote's super cool. Check it out if you're doing something like this. 
Um, I already talked about how collaboration was good for this work. And I think the people on this call will understand, you know, magnetospheres and spacecraft data enough that I don't need to get into that. Um, we're, we're showcasing five PyHC packages here, which is cool. PySpeedAst, SpacePy, PlasmaPy, PyTplot, and Komodo. They all play very important roles in doing this work here, and they play synergistically to make what should be a pretty complicated science problem, you know, easily achievable. And uh, we'll be putting some subset of this code up on like the PyHC um, gallery after I finish submitting this paper. Because, you know, if you want to use any of these features from these packages, it's a good example of putting it to use. Um, so let's, let's start comparing some magnetopause models to some spacecraft data real quick. Um, all, you know, all you have to do to reproduce the work in this paper is hit this run notebook button up top. I've already clicked it once, so I, I won't do it again. But, you know, just to give you an idea, if you were reading this paper, you know, say you'd get a, a plot like this, which, you know, plot A up here, you're seeing um, how far the spacecraft is from the magnetopause. And when you get to its zero Earth radii away from the magnetopause, you're at the boundary and you're crossing it. And you can see this plot in a static paper and just trust that I had done my work properly. But in the executable version, boom, here's the code that generated the plot right there in line. And you could just you know, click play to reproduce the plot and show that I've actually used the data properly. Or you could even you know, change something here. And you can see how it affects the outcome, which is another benefit of executable papers is it's a great launching point for modifying research into um, you know, something different that you're doing. So what are we doing? We're, we're looking at this time range of data because magnetopause and the magnetosphere just in general do a lot of cool things around this time. This is actually a time range used in a lot of papers, especially MMS papers. Um, and we're, we're getting three different sets of data from Pi Speed S, the MEC data, the flux gate magnetometer, and the ion moments. And with Pi Speed S, those are just one liners, which is nice. Just one line for each of the different kinds of variables. And we can just throw this in a little helper function to load the data. And then I'm not going to walk through all the code that we're doing with space by here, but it's doing really clever calculations with solar wind data um, to reproduce a, um, a model of the magnetopause and actually estimating things like how close is the spacecraft to where the model would think the magnetopause is, et cetera. And yeah, we can just load up the data from Pi Speed S, calculate things with SpacePy, and then boom, we, we get out the plots that we're seeing here. And we can guess that according to this um, plot here between like, you know, 1500 and 1600 UTC, there was a magnetopause crossing. And later when we look at the real data, we'll, you know, actually find indications of it and we'll see how close was that estimate. Everything else I can go through kind of a bit more quickly. Um, with plasma pi, we're calculating plasma parameters from this MMS data to kind of help us figure out where the crossings happen in the real world. Um, I'm scrolling by a bunch of one-liners to get the various plasma parameters, which is also a great thing that plasma pi offers us. You know, pretty much pretty much any plasma parameter you can think of can be calculated with a one-liner. Um, and then, yeah, set up the, the plots again, and boom, you get plots out. And I talk about this a bit in the paper, but already a pretty easy way to tell whether or not you're inside the magnetosphere is to kind of look for sudden changes in this data. And hopefully people see my, my cursor here. Because yep. um, I'm showing vertically between 1300 and 1400, you go from a lot of activity 
up and down to things kind of level out a little bit, except for right here, about 1500, you're getting a bunch of spikes again. That's actually uh, two different magnetopause crossings. So if I remember the science correctly, we're outside the magnetopause over here when it's all noisy. And once we enter the Earth's magnetosphere, things get a bit shielded and it quiets down a bit. You can see the same thing in the actual MMS data, which the way it's loaded in um, with pi speed as it gets put into t-plot variables and it becomes just a one-liner to spit out all the data that you're using into a plot like this. We're seeing the same around between 13 and 1400 UTC and right here at 1500, the data changes in that, in that same way. So that makes us pretty confident that if our data is showing these dramatic changes and the plasma parameters from this data are all in agreement, that's probably where the magnetopause actually was. And I, I show here in the paper that we can actually conclude the magnetopause was further from Earth than the model predicted because the model thought the crossing would have happened um, at a different time. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the magnetopause half of this. Are you inside the magnetosphere? If you actually want to get fancier, you know, physics-based models of the magnetosphere model more or less the whole thing. You know, you build up the entire model from first principles in, in these kinds of models, and you can get it more specifics, like what are the magnetic field components in the X, Y, and Z direction. And um, figuring out the, the correlating model data for your satellites is really easy using Komodo's fly-through software. Um, it supports a number of models right now. We'll be using the open GGCM data just because that's what we have available to us. Um, which actually I should pause to, to point out here actually that all the data that we're using for this project is preloaded in the, uh, the environment. So we, ha we have the MMS data stored over here. We have um, all the model data for space pi and stuff and um, magnetosphere models, which is important because this um, executable paper is containerized with everything that you need for the research. So it's not like, hey, go get the data from this URL first and then plug it into our notebook. As you know, who knows if that link is going to be alive 10 years from now, right? So we package everything in one container so that you can just share the container around and you're guaranteed to always have working software with working data when you're um, reproducing your research, which is super nice. We had to shrink the model data here a little bit to get it to actually fit because we're using a free deep mode account right now that doesn't have a whole bunch of space, but it wasn't too bad. So basically we just point Komodo at our model data. We tell it that we're wanting to look at B, X, Y, and Z. You know, the model has various variables and we're just gonna be looking at those three. And I would call it a one-liner. It's long enough that I broke it out onto three lines, but you, ru you run the model fly through code once and it generates um, a bunch of data in CSV output for you and plots to kind of visualize what's happening. Um, it can take a minute, so you can also read it just back in with a CSV reader once you've already got your CSV output which I have right over here, it's this file here. So I can just read that. And it gives you two different things. It gives you 3D and 1D models. And I, I was not a part of any of this implementation. So all credit to Rebecca and the CCM team for doing this kind of stuff. But you know, you've, you've probably seen 1D plots like this before. You know, you're just seeing a time series of the magnetic field component over here. But in this nice 3D view they have, this black dot is the Earth, and this colorful bar here is the satellite's orbit. So you know you could imagine if you did it for hours and hours, days and days, you would get a, a complete circle around Earth here. And you can you know, color code and see what the magnetic field components are. Um, these get exported as X HTML files. These are just screenshots in the paper, but when you actually have this pulled up in front of you, you can 
open the HTML file and actually interact with the plot itself. So this is that 3D image from earlier. And you can, you can see that this is fully interactive and you can scan over things to see the actual data points. So here's the model of what we think the magnetosphere should be doing at the time that our spacecraft was flying through it. And um, to just compare the real data to the modeled data, you functionalize it, which is a whole Komodo concept that I won't explain today. And that lets you do things like Komodo object dot plot and then give it the real MMS data and the model data and you get out stuff like this. This is a super rough and not scientifically useful um, modeling because we, we shrunk the data files so much that you just you, you lose all that um, all that data and it just becomes you know you, you get we think I think maybe one measurement every 10 minutes is what we're doing right now not fine green enough to actually see magnetosphere activity really but if you just threw bigger data at it you would be reproducing something really similar to this plot here and you know in that little code you can really test whether or not you have a good model by comparing it against spacecraft data round of applause that's pretty much the whole paper we just we, we talk in the results in the discussion about how open science principles guided creating this thing and how sharing papers in this format really lowers the boundary for reproducing people's work and for um, just sharing your work in general, right? Like we'll make a static version of this, just a regular old Word document and submit it to the journal, but we'll get a DOI for the executable version and link to it. So anyone who reads our paper can go right here to the executable version and see exactly what our research is about which I think is pretty powerful. Uh, I think you yeah, have just a whole bunch of references at this point, acknowledging some people and woohoo. If you want to read more about who we are, it's down here at the bottom. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't need to go into any more depth than that, I think. So, you know, this is going to be submitted to Frontiers in Astronomy and Space Sciences here within the next, I'd say, month. And, um, you know, hopefully it represents us well. Thanks, Thanks Sean. All got. Um, yeah, I think this looks awesome and I'm excited for it to be submitted. And I hope to see more of these kind of papers, especially from our group in the future. But yeah, I'm gonna be encouraging anyone who I <laughs> Here writing a paper, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking to you about making this kind of version. <laughs> yes, please, everyone, ask Sean about his experience and expertise in this now. Uh, Pete, you have a question. Yeah, uh, so that's really impressive. Um, I, I've got um, a bunch of questions in terms of how it's going to work out in practice, but maybe that's something that you're going to uh, find out over the next couple of months. One of them is, is how you link. So if you're publishing this in Frontiers, does that mean you have to um, create two separate documents or is there a way to combine the two to make your work easier? It's two separate documents. Yeah. And they'll, they'll each okay. have separate DOIs. Okay. So that means you have to work through two sets of references, yeah, two sets of formatting. Yep. I mean, you know, the, the version we submit would just be a repackaging of this and you know the content should be as identical as possible but you know like we're gonna have to change the code blocks that you have here into just like screenshots of the code and little things like that when we go to submit it but it should be pretty darn similar otherwise okay i just asked one more quick question and i see rebecca has a question too is this uh, python focused or if you wrote um analysis in r can you use that as well does it support that yeah, it actually does. Um, one of the nice things about um, Deep Note is that it supports other languages like R. Um, I know like Google okay. Lab, for example, um, I'm pretty sure it only works for Python. Um, but we even have an appendix over here um, with some Deep Note alternatives where we we compare and contrast, you know, different platforms you could have done this on 
but yeah, one of the things about deep note is that it is sort of language agnostic. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how the, the rest of the process goes. Yeah, I you know haven't heard reviewer comments yet, so that's when it's going to get really interesting. For sure. What's up, Rebecca? Mine is more of a comment than a question. If someone else has a question, then feel free to go first. I think you're free to go ahead, Rebecca. Okay, just don't want to dominate the conversation. Um, but one thing I would kind of a pro and a con is that some of the pushback we've already gotten about this particular paper is that it has to be more than just a, um, a tutorial to be published as a paper. Now that opinion may shift in the future, right? But that's one of the reasons that we approach this paper from an open science argument and the collaboration argument rather than just section two, which is all the methods and the code that we all collaborated on. Um, so there's that kind of warning, like just because you make a, a, an executable paper that um, shows how to use this and that doesn't mean that's publishable, right? But if you're doing using all of these things to do science, like like uh, Iwa, Iwa Zhang, the last one on the author list, she's planning on using this to and expanding on it to include more physics-based models, more time ranges in the data set to do a science study. That would be publishable, right? So you have to kind of judge whether your work is publishable by considering a couple of those things. But we definitely need more of these, at least in the PyAT tutorial gallery, right? Mm -hmm. That was the idea. Um, I think like 11 things in the chat came through when I was talking. I haven't read any of them. I don't know if any of that was pertinent to what we were talking about here. Um, I don't think so. Cool. Uh, maybe the only thing I would note is that Ryan McGranahan has that space data um, collection. <laughs> I might be saying the exact name wrong. He put a link to it in the chat. And he specifically mentioned that if we have hackathon, you know, interesting results that come out, feel free to publish there. It's a really low hanging fruit way to get, you know, something out. Sweet. Pete. Uh, sorry to be a question hog. Does anybody know uh, whether or not any of the um, peer reviewed journals are trying to uh, implement something like this? I mean, is anybody trying to buy DeepNote, for example? I, I can answer that. Um, basically, no, sadly. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the journal Elsevier, but they're probably the, the people who have put the most work into this. Um, but that was back in 2011. They had a huge push for trying to develop executable papers, materials, and they did like a big challenge and awarded lots of money to the people who did it best. But no one ever implemented anything so good that Elsevier itself started ex um, accepting executable papers as submissions, which is kind of funny. To my knowledge, no, no journal with any kind of clout would accept this as a formal submission. Because, you know, the big problem is um, like basically a hosting problem. You know, someone's got to pay to host all the data and all of the code and the, the, the environment along with the paper. And, you know, that that costs money. You can't just be accepting everybody's data and everyone's papers without some kind of uh, business model behind it. I think that's probably the biggest uh, blocker right now. Nick mentioned, uh, I heard that AAS Publications is considering an integration with Jupyter Notebooks. So that's a start. Oh, that would be neat. Yeah. Um, Angel, you have your hand up. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. Yep. <laughs> Perhaps put your question in the chat. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, yeah, putting in the chat. What about now? Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. This is what it was a microphone. Um, 
yeah um i said this is uh never uh, something i never seen before uh, unless it was a dashboard on tableau or 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 3 djs and i i really really like this idea and my question is is if this support the python by widgets for example uh, some dia in order to make a yeah. interactive uh, graphic it's it's hit or miss um there's there's one widget that I tried to use that didn't work, which is like the little sliders that you can put above like plots to say, you know, walk X through values one to a hundred or something using a slider. That did not work, but um, Komodo actually uses um, a widget to, whoops, that's not the right section, to put out its plots in an interactive kind of fashion. And, um, as I don't think I showed, these actually are inter interactive and you can click around the plot and stuff. So that's, um, you know, Deep Note is actually a fairly new platform and they're still implementing a lot of this stuff. And they have like GitHub issues you can see about different widget supports, but they, they do a decent job. Long story short. Okay, thank you. It looks uh, so, so good. Yeah, thank you. Ideally, the you know more time that goes on, the more implementations we can will have and things they can handle and work with. So exactly, but no, there um there actually was some poetry in picking Deep Note over other platforms though, because this is arguably the newest platform uh, of all the options out there. But PyHC is also a new organization, and we're writing a new kind of paper. So you know pushing the frontier and all that. I like it. Cool. Well, we were originally <laughs> going to have just a quick hackathon um, project intro, but we have a minute left of the meeting today. So I think instead we'll just start tomorrow with a quick, you know, elevator pitch for each project um, for hackathons and go from there. So thanks to everyone who came and presented today. Thanks to all who came and listened and asked all the great questions. And we will see you all tomorrow again, same time, same place for some great hackathons. Yeah, until tomorrow. Bye.